Many years ago, we moved into what was technically called the last house on the left at the end of a long road. When we moved in, previous tenants warned us that odd things would happen there. Well, we didn't believe them at first, but our disbelief was short-lived. It began with my four-year-old daughter screaming at something she had seen in the living room. She said it was a black cloud that had crossed the room and disappeared into a corner. At the time, we dismissed it, but a few days later, when my wife's sister came for a visit, she watched in horror as that same black cloud reappeared from the same corner and enveloped her two little girls. Later that same day, my wife saw that same cloud come from the corner and wrap itself around her. She described it as suffocating, it was hot and smelling of sulfur and burning meat. The cloud seemed to manifest itself around only women and girls. Fortunately for my sons, that did not mean that males were spared from the haunting. The house was built into the side of a hill with the front door on the west, and it opened onto the second floor where the living room and dining room and kitchen and bathroom were. The door on the east side of the house opened onto the first floor where the bedrooms and laundry room were located. The front door always squeaked loudly and no amount of WD-40 graphite or silicone gel would make it quiet. One night, the boys, aged eight and six, heard the front door open, so they went to investigate. In the open front door, they saw an odd green mist, and when they approached the door to see from where the glow was originating, it vanished. My younger son was the one who discovered the specter's aversion to pleasant smells. My wife would set out store-bought air fresheners, but this was useless. Once the room was vacated, the fresheners would be closed. My younger son pointed this out, as well as the fact that the scented candles we used would extinguish themselves when the room was empty. My older boy was beset with his own terror. Frequently, he would awaken in his bottom bunk to find a horrific, contorted face shrieking at him. It was an aged and wrinkled face of uncertain gender. He would also learn to put away his toys. One night, he was roused from his sleep by the sound of his toys moving around on the floor. He opened his eyes to see a small black being moving his trucks, warships, and cars against the door as if to barricade it from entry. As soon as they realized he was watching them, they turned and began climbing the covers, trying to get at him. He screamed, and I came running to find him clinging to the bottom boards of his brother's upper bunk. Until now, I had seen nothing, so I was still somewhat skeptical of all these stories, but that was about to change. We were asleep downstairs, and I was dreaming. In my dream, I walked into our bedroom, but there was no bedroom furniture there. It was furnished as a living room, and on the sofa sat the most beautiful, red-headed woman I had ever seen. My wife, beautiful in her own right, was a brunette, but in this dream, I knew the redhead was my wife. She was crying. She turned and looked at me through blackened, tear-filled, frightened eyes. I should have felt pity for this woman, but I felt only rage. She cowered into an arm of the sofa, and I started toward her to continue the beating I knew she deserved. I heard a voice and realized that the dream had been silent up to that point. Somehow I knew this was because my wife was deaf. The voice had come from my six-year-old. I turned and saw my real-life son standing in the doorway wearing clothes I had never seen before. He was wearing black pants and a long sleeve red pullover. He was soaking wet from head to toe and his skin was ashen and lifeless. And again, I felt no love for my family, only a burning rage. The boy looked up at me and said, Dad. He too had a look of abject fear in his eyes, but he continued, Dad, help me. I turned to him and with an uncontrolled fury, I raised my fist and struck the child square in the face. I sat up in bed, suddenly awake, and my wife was awake beside me, screaming, What the hell was that? 
I realized that there was a fight going on in the living room above my head. Two men were yelling at each other, throwing around furniture and breaking glass. I jumped from my bed and ran upstairs. And as my foot fell on the carpeted hallway of the second story, it went silent. No one was there. The windows were intact. The furniture was upright. Nothing was out of place. But the door stood open, shrouded in an iridescent green glow. I walked over and looked out onto the darkened street. There was nothing. Everything was quiet. Fallen autumn leaves swirled in the cool night's breeze, and I returned to my wife and climbed into bed and waited with her in silence for the dawn. And dawn did come, and as it happened, it was October the 31st. I stood on my front porch drinking my coffee and trying to rationalize my dream, and then I heard it. A chill locked my spine as I heard my six-year-old son say, Dad? Afraid, I turned and looked down the hill to where my son was crouched down doing something. Dad, help me, he said. I approached to see that he was using a stick to try to dig something out of the ground. It was a strip of black corduroy. I bent down to help him, but pulled him away when I saw a flash of yellowed bone and I grabbed him and ran into the house. The police came and dug up the remains of a little boy. He was six when he died, and he was wearing black corduroy pants and a long sleeve red pullover shirt. My brother is now a detective with the local police department, and although they have a lengthy file on the boy's father, they remain unable to locate him or his beautiful, deaf, red-headed wife. My Bigfoot encounter happened on Saturday night, July 24th, 2016 on the edge of Yosemite National Park Wilderness Camping Area. Be careful when camping in California. Bigfoots are there, even though California Rangers say, no, it must have been a bear. Trust me, it was no bear, and that's fact. My name is Steve, and I'm 59 years old. I've lived in the golden state of California my whole life. I have always hunted since I was young and I lived in the city at the same time. My family had connections to the Central Valley of California and Dad liked hunting ducks and pheasants mostly. So that's how a city boy in California turned out to be an outdoor guy who ends up owning an outfitting business in Afton, Wyoming while living in Silicon Valley in the early days and I'm still here, unfortunately. Six years ago, while working on my home, I had a bad head trauma accident, and I ended up in the ICU for six weeks. Before the accident, I had an active life with little time to do much but what was at hand. So now I find myself house-ridden for two years with nothing to do but lay on my bed for hours having nightmares about scary thoughts. Due to the accident, I have bad PTSD. I get up every night between 1.30 and 3.30, needing something to keep my mind busy from negative thoughts or other things that I can't remember or pronounce. Each night I get on my iPad searching for Bigfoot, and my mind would be safe for hours. During the long hours of reading and watching every video I could find, I started to learn and realize these folks had no idea what they were doing chasing these creatures. So I took my knowledge of hunting in years of outfitting and I started studying how to get one. The recovery from my operations was taking longer than I thought, so I was getting frustrated. And I decided to get out of the house and go hunting for Bigfoot. I knew that these creatures were living supposedly in my state. It's just there's a lot of woods in California, so I needed some locations to start. During my early morning studies, I read about a nationally known Bigfoot organization, and that is where I started. I contacted them and got set up to go on a trip in Northern California. The lead on the trip contacted us and wanted to talk about what would take place. There was no guarantee of seeing anything due to the creatures being very secretive and elusive. I told him I did not leave my home much due to the above issues, so I wasn't going to be able to go alone, and I was looking to go with another person. 
My wife is my caregiver and was not interested in chasing these so-called Bigfoot animals around at night with strangers. Well, I had time on my side, so I started asking all my family members. None were interested in my crazy adventure idea. They thought my mind might be slipping further, but it wasn't. No one believed in these animals, and they were not going to waste valuable time searching it out with me. And then I went outside the family and finally convinced a young man named Conrad, who my wife and I had mentored for years, and we love and trust him. Conrad hadn't camped ever before in his life and was looking forward to camping, but did not really think much of Bigfoot. So I was excited that I had a trip for these elusive animals, and now I would get them figured out in no time. Yeah, right, I would get them figured out. Conrad and I received the email where all of us folks were to meet up for our Bigfoot research trip. We all got to the state park camping area that we were going to call home for the next four days. While setting up our gear, we started talking with others from the group. Conrad and I couldn't believe how many of these strangers were just normal folks seeming to be helpful to everyone. I figured that we might be in for some real crackpots chasing these creatures, and I was prepared for anything. So everything was good to this point, and we were starting to relax and mingle. And during the first night sitting around the campfire, we discovered that we liked the same TV shows, same books, magazines, and so the days went by fast. On the last night, we had driven up to a dry, dusty fire road to park trucks and then climb to the top of a mountain. This all took place in the pitch dark. When we were at the top, we were to sit and listen. We made calls and we made tree knocks to try to drum up something to respond, but everything was quiet. We spent most of the time looking at the stars and sitting on warmed rocks from the day's sun and relaxing. We spent all that time listening for any responses to our calls or knocks. Well, after a few hours, the lead person informed the group that we should head back to the trucks because we were going to meet up with another group, and we talked with them about what we should do next. It was 2.30 a.m., and most were tired from the past four nights of hiking and with limited sleep. We all came up with a plan, and we started to go our different ways back to camp. I decided to go back the same way that I came up. I knew I had some good looks at some meadows when the light of the truck would brighten them up, and I could see everything in those fields. The lead person asked us to drive slowly to keep dust down for better viewing from the truck. I asked if any of the folks wanted to come with us since I had room for three and were going straight back to camp. Conrad and I were leaving when three ladies decided to join us for the trip back. We started down the steep rocky slope. There was thick brush and grass on either side and it scratched the sides of the truck as I rolled. We were all talking about how much we had enjoyed the trip and were exchanging phone numbers so that we could keep in touch. And halfway down the bumpy road, Conrad started screaming, There's a Bigfoot! He was pointing at a big red-eyed creature standing 40 feet in front of our truck behind some shrubs off to the right side. Well, I looked at this creature and it was standing there just staring at us. I wasn't running or even walking. It just stared at us with big red eyes the size of limes set inside sockets of a huge head. It moved to the right. I could see shoulders in the side of its head. I stopped the truck, and at that moment, all three of the ladies who were sitting in the back started screaming because they saw this thing and they were ready to leave. I was seeing something I really was not sure existed, and I wasn't ready to leave yet. So I slammed my hand down on the dash, and I said, We're here to see this thing, and there it is, and I'm not leaving. It wasn't doing anything but standing there. Then it moved a little to the right and my eyes were locked on it. I wanted to open the door and get a better look, but I was trapped in the tiny road with bushes on either side and no space to get out. I wanted to get a better view when it started to move out of the headlights. The head was enormous, and it was all covered in dark hair or fur of some sort. It moved further right into the bushes and small trees. 
but it was too dark for a picture or a video, so I just wanted to see it if I could get my flare on it and then follow it into the forest. Unfortunately, the flare was in the back of the truck and I was in a tight spot on the road. And at that moment, I was not thinking of how or what to do. I just kept my eyes on it as long as I could. All this time, I was completely scared beyond my limits, and I was wondering if at any second I might start to have a medical situation, which would make my body shake uncontrollably and my mind begin to scramble. Maybe the situation was too much for me to continue functioning due to my injuries. Well, that's why I brought Conrad, so that he could get me back to camp in the event that this happened. I had no idea how he would react if this situation were to take place. I figured out quickly as I asked Conrad to lower his window to help me figure out where this thing was when he quickly responded by yelling, Hell no, I'm not rolling my window down. Well, I remained calm so the others would not be more scared than they already were. I wanted to get out of the truck, but then I wondered if they would drive away in a panic and leave me there but I started to get out anyway. I was halfway out of my truck and I was jammed between the door and the bushes, and I couldn't keep my eyes on it at the same time while moving to the back of the truck through the bushes where the flare was located. I slowly pushed through the bushes back to the truck tailgate and I reached in with one hand while watching and listening for movement. And I could hear this thing moving around but didn't know exactly where it was. It seemed to be moving a little further away because the branch breaking seemed to get more faint. The thought that maybe there were two or more creatures concerned me, though. Maybe this one was distracting us while another moved in. And in addition, I never caught wind of a foul smell. Your mind messes with you at times like this, and this situation was going by much too fast and scary for my body to keep up. That's when I noticed that this fear was different from any other fear I'd ever felt in my life. It seemed to envelop my whole body, like if you were to ski the whole day and get cold and then walk in a warm house where the heat hits you in a rush. It was a very weird sense of fear, almost like I was in a bubble. I finally got the flare out of the truck and started looking down the small hill where the creature was before I lost sight of it, and I couldn't see it anymore. I wasn't hearing any movement. Meanwhile, the others in the truck were radioing the group on what was happening and asked for them to come help us. Once the others started to arrive, my fear went away as we talked about what had just taken place. I couldn't really say what had happened. Maybe I was in mild shock. But I'm glad I saw it with five other people instead of seeing it by myself. Now that makes us all crazy, not just me. We got back to the main camp and talked more on what had taken place, cracking up on how no one else would even roll the window down to assist me. We were on a Bigfoot research trip and we actually saw one, and we lost all thoughts of what we should have done, and it still makes me laugh. Conrad and I were so amped up that we couldn't sleep, so we stayed up until the morning sitting near the fire. Both of us were still trying to understand what we had seen, It took me two weeks to settle on the realization that we had actually seen a Sasquatch. Well, the next morning we packed up camp and we left for home where I hoped I could get some sleep. We both talked the whole way home about why our government has not been honest on this subject. At no point did I ever think of shooting it. I had carried an ACP pistol ready to use on my hip, but I never reached for it. I suppose I would have had the fear not been so overwhelming. In addition, it makes sense to me why there have been so many sightings and virtually no good images taken. I believe it's the fear and shock of actually seeing something like this. I mean, we were on a Bigfoot trip and had everything we needed in the truck, and everyone was too scared to even think about taking a picture. If we did take a picture, it would have been a big black blurry blob like many others. You're caught so off guard when you get lucky enough to see one, and the last thing you're thinking about is grabbing a camera. My only thought throughout the whole ordeal, even though it may have seemed brave that I got out of the truck, was, 
Is there enough distance between me and this monster that I can get away if I need to? I have been out many times since this encounter, and I've been out of California and have had many different types of interactions with these creatures, but I've never had another visual. I've hunted Alaska, Canada, and all over North America. I've harvested many large game animals and many at long distances. These Bigfoot can be taken with a properly placed shot. However, standing 40 feet from this creature, I'm not the one who could have ever gotten the shot off that would have needed to take it down. The fear would not have allowed me to have been steady enough to hit the target. I shoot 50 yards offhand with pistols all the time at metal targets the size of a soda can, and I'm a good shot. I would not have had a chance at 40 feet with a head bigger than a Home Depot five-gallon bucket. If someone can control the fear and properly place a good shot to the head, it will go down quickly in my opinion. But if you miss, you could be in for a bad day. There's more to these creatures than we all know yet. They kind of incapacitate someone with fear from doing and thinking straight. Some say it's infrasound. I think maybe we should just stay tuned until the creature allows us more insight on what is going on with them.